Hey everyone, we just did, Bo Hashem, another uh, installment to our series, Jewish Ashkafa, the Jewish ideology about everything that you need to know in order to live a good life. Most importantly, we went into the sources. We went into things that are relevant to everybody's life. What does God actually think about the Mechalel Shabbat? Everyone knows. But what do the Chachamim say? Many people use the video by Rav David Yosef uh, as their scapegoat to say that you shouldn't rebuke people about Chilul Shabbat. In fact, what does Rav David Yosef say about that? What does Rav Ovadia, his father, say that? Say about that? Uh, you'll be surprised because it's not like the video. Uh, in fact, there are many people that are quoting that God needs you. What do the books say? Or that Genom is uh, really not such a scary place. What did the books say? Yes, there is a movie, but there's another source tonight. Lots of interesting things. And in fact, the most interesting part is to see how the good traits of some people lead to evil among others, including the ones that have good traits. You'll be surprised at so many amazing things are relevant to your everyday life. Enjoy and let me know how you liked it. Call Tuf. We're back here, continuing a, uh, our series, Jewish Ashkafa. We missed out on last week, Baruch Hashem. Uh, we are uh, back to it, and uh, tonight also is Rosh Chodesh. New month, Baruch Hashem, new fortune, new success, new Avodat uh, Hashem, new servitude of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Tonight's year will be for the Refua uh, Shlema, for the uh, Rabbanit Sarah Bat uh, Anat, Rabbanit uh, Levana Bat Sarah, Rabbi Ephraim Ben Shulamit, uh, Aurora, Serenity Bat Amalia, also for the uh, uh, Refua Shlema for Avi Mori, David Ben Nesriya, Imi Morati Doris Bat Jora, and also for the Atzlacha Rabba, for all of Am Yisrael and all the righteous Noahides, all the people that continue to watch us, support the organization Bezat Hashem, where we're uh, working very hard, Baruch Hashem, to do many new things, to try to uh, cater to the public, try to do as much as possible to uh, help Am Yisrael, help the world see the truth about Hashem, see the truth about the Torah, and uh, run away from all the confusion that's out there, especially since the uh, evil inclination continues to produce much more material each day, sending new messengers to confuse people even more. And this is uh, part of the reason of why learning the uh, Jewish Ashkafa, the Jewish ideology, is more important than ever today, simply because most people don't really understand what is the uh, Jewish ideology, even if they've been frumed their whole life, they've been religious their whole life, they have uh, went to yeshiva, they went to a Jewish seminary, they uh, did a lot of different things, but uh, as soon as they start tuning into these lectures based on the teachings of the Chazonish and the other Chachamim that uh, we bring, uh, they're, uh, they're enamored. They're simply enamored. This is all new to them. Uh, you know, several uh, people have told me over the last couple of weeks that even though they've been religious their whole life, uh, when they watch my lectures, they feel like they, are, they have to do tshuva. They have to uh, start learning everything anew. They didn't learn some of these basic teachings in yeshiva, in seminary. And Baruch Hashem, that we have the merit to help Am Yisrael in all, uh, from all spectrums, whether they're religious, Hasidish, Ashkenazi, Sephardi, uh, newly religious, religious their whole life. Uh, and of course, you know, all of the uh, righteous Noahides, the people that want to serve Hashem, either for the sake of converting to Judaism or for simply for the sake of being a righteous person in the world that could also acquire Olam Abba. Uh, so with that being said, we have, Baruch Hashem, a lot of uh, interesting information here. And uh, as you've seen, perhaps from the uh, description to the lecture, we're starting a new section here in Chapter 4 of the Chazonish Sefer Emunah V'Bitachon. Uh, and this is Section 10 of, uh, of Emunah V'Bitachon, uh, Section 10, Chapter 4. Uh, or say chapter, chapter 4, Section 10. And here the Chazonish is beginning this section with a completely new insight that is as relevant today as it's ever been. In fact, it's more relevant today than it's ever been, where you see sometimes, and it's unfortunate to see it, good people do bad things. And not only good people do bad things, where sometimes you could find yourself you know, having, uh, a, you know, developed good inclinations, whether it be generosity or it be humility or it be anything else that a person, you know, is, is, is good character, but that turned into something bad. 
And uh, this is one of the ways of the Yetzirah, one of the ways of the evil inclination to literally fool a person into a mitzvah, into a deed, into something that looks good, but in reality, he's doing the will of the Satan the whole time. And this is uh, unfortunately very common in the world today because we are in the end of days before Mashiach comes. Uh, because unlike the Christian church, we don't believe the Mashiach has come. The, uh, the Jewish Mashiach has not come and Bezat Hashem will come very soon. But one of the uh, prophecies uh, that many of the sages discuss is that at the end of days, the, uh, there's going to be an extraordinary amount of confusion out there. And one of the pillars of the confusion, one of the uh, sources, I should say, of confusion is going to be from the leadership. Uh, we reviewed this extensively in the series called Era of Mashiach by the book uh, of uh, Rav Elchanan Vaslamen, Allah wa Shalom. He wrote it right before the Holocaust and literally everything that he wrote has come true over the last 75 years mainly his significant section about the, uh, the uh, wayward shepherds, the evil shepherds that are misguiding the generation. And he's not talking about the evil shepherds only being the uh, Zionist government that wants to eliminate the Torah. He's not talking about just the evil shepherds like the uh, George Soros evil empire. No, no, he's also talking about the rabbinical shepherds that are sometimes misguiding the people unintentionally and sometimes, unfortunately, misguiding them intentionally, as we've discussed many times by exposing many of these evil shepherds, whether they be rabbis or otherwise, uh, anytime they do things that are contrary to the Torah, anytime that they're misguiding people, part of our role in the world is to bring clarity, clarity from the Torah. And if that clarity means that we have to expose evil that's coming from anybody out there, then that's what we're going to do. And Baruch Hashem, it's helped quite a few people. So here, the Chazonish is now going to elaborate on how such a thing can happen where a person can have good intentions, but his acts will lead to evil, even if that is yourself. Okay, even more so, the Chazonish is going to elaborate how the, you know, the evil will many times have good nature and good traits and will actually bring people closer to his evil deeds, closer to his evil intentions because of his good traits, you know, cute smile and uh, and jokes. This is unfortunately one of the things that we're seeing today where every other day there's another person that is uh, creating a video that is trying to uh, take the Torah and put it upside down and call it, no, no, this is really the, uh, the understanding of the sages throughout all of the generations, even though you can't find anything that he's saying quoted anywhere. But needless to say, these are some of the things we're going to discuss tonight. Be'ezrat Hashem. So the Chazonish finished off section 9 with letting us know that it's purposeless for a person that is working on himself, working on ourselves to develop better character traits, to eliminate the, uh, you know, the, the bad that they were doing, their addictions, whether it's addiction to lust or addiction to any other type of evil thing, uh, to, to eliminate all of the pride that a person has, whether naturally or unnaturally, many people have accustomed themselves to doing bad things. And fortunately, in, in the world today, you see many times people are attracted to arrogant people. One of the things that put, for example, Donald Trump on the, uh, uh, on the possibility of being even a president before he became a president was the show that he had, where he had a show called The Apprentice, where he would uh, fire or hire people you know, after embarrassing them uh, in public. And unfortunately, many people love this show. They love the arrogance that came from him that, that literally uh, came out of every word that came out of his mouth. They love the arrogance because they confuse the arrogance with confidence. And many times you see different speakers and leaders lead their, uh, their uh, crew the same way where they're telling people we're the best, we're this, but they take it a step further where they simply destroy whoever is opposing them. So it's not just saying that they are good at what they do, but also whoever's not doing what we're doing is evil. Now, of course, when a person is looking in a mirror, how would they possibly know if they're in the same position? The only possible way is to compare themselves to what a Kadosh Baruch Hu, their creator, has assigned for them, has obligated them. If what you're doing is in line with what the Torah says, you're going in, a, in the right direction regardless of what anybody says. 
if you're going contrary to the Torah, then of course you're going against what Hashem said. And it does matter what everybody says if they're telling you that you actually have to change. And it does matter what everybody says if they're applauding you because you have to stop listening to them. So the Chazunish is now telling us here that it's very important for a person to pay attention to every single thing that he does, every single thing that she does, but don't put yourself in a situation where you're testing yourself. Why? It's not necessary. It's not necessary to put yourself in front of a test to see if you're going to look at that girl that's not your wife, if you're going to steal that thing that, you know, that belongs to somebody else, if you're going to do such and such. Don't put yourself in a test to see where you stand. Why? Because if you are being particular about following the law of the Torah, the test will come naturally. You won't have to put yourself into a test because if a person is following the law, the way they're supposed to, where they're learning Musar, which is character development, and they're also learning Allah, they're learning the law itself, and they're combining the two, that means that they're constantly going to work on themselves mentally to review every single one of the actions that they've done, but also, even more importantly, every one of the ex- actions they want to do, where they know they have an appointment, and the appointment was somebody from a different company, they don't know if it's a male, if it's a female. They know that if it's a female and uh, she wants to shake his hand, that is a little bit of a problem. They know if this female is a uh, is a, um, a person that dresses immodestly, that can be a problem. If a person that uh, is uh, you know is is not an honest person, but they want to give you a bunch of business, that is a problem. So a person has to already prepare themselves mentally. What will I do? If this situation comes up in business, the same goes, person comes home, they're, they're, they're ready to, to go home, but they know that their wife has had a hell of a day. The kids are jumping off the walls. One of the kids got in trouble in school. The other one hasn't done homework in six months. And they know that their wife, as soon as they get home, the smoke that's coming out of her ears is also going to come out of her mouth as soon as she tells you about her whole day. And you really don't feel like hearing it. Why? You've had a day of your own. You've had a tough time of your own. Your boss is on your case. The customers are never happy. And you really don't want to hear it. But you really want, if you respond to her in that way, you know that that smoke will turn into fire. So what do you do? You have to literally start developing your, your argument, your words, carefully before you even open up the door, before you even get out of your car. Why? What are you going to say if she says this? What are you going to say if she does this? And already repeat, repeat, repeat until you've gone accustomed to the point where you realize, okay, whatever she says, I have a response in order to avoid a fight in order to avoid hurting her, in order to avoid hurting myself, in order to avoid this getting out of proportion because I know she had a tough day, but really all she wants is a little bit of attention, a little bit of my time, and just an open ear because who else is she going to talk to? So the important thing is for you to review this before you get home. Same exact thing goes for every aspect of life. If a person is particular about following the law, and the law itself of the Torah is not only about when to give tzedakah or when to eat this type of food or when to celebrate a holiday. Part of the law is to develop your character traits in order to eliminate anything that's contrary to what Hashem wants you to do. He doesn't want you to be arrogant, but He also at the same token doesn't want you to be humble to the point where you are allowing and even inviting people to step on you. So at the same token, a person has to pick a middle ground. He doesn't want you to be stingy, but at the same token, he doesn't want you to be generous to the point where all the thieves know exactly which door to knock on. So a person has to develop their character traits as part of following the law and as well as actually following the law itself, knowing when you have to wear tzitzit, when you have to say Shema Yisrael, when you have to pray, when you have to eat such and such food, when you're... You're obligated to cancel a meeting or even cancel a party or just simply not attend when you have to rebuke somebody or when you have to simply be quiet. It's important for a person to be very particular about the law. And of course, the only way that this is going to happen is if he studies Torah, if she studies Torah, if they study what they're supposed to do, whether it's through lectures or books or a combination thereof, the person is going to be a winner, a winner in life and of course, a winner for eternity. But this is something that a person does not need to practice in real life because if he is particular about following the law, then he is going to live these different circumstances in his mind, in our mind, before they even happen. 
And then when those things do actually happen, they'll know how they actually reacted and if they are truly humble or they're just humble in their mind. They are truly generous or they were really just generous in their mind. They are truly good or they were just really good but in their dreams. They'll see in real life when they're actually following what they thought and what they believed or they're doing the opposite. So this was the end of the last section. Now the Chazonish is telling us if the precise and exact observance of the laws is the is one of the ways to correct a person's traits then neglecting this observance is one of the things that prevents him from developing this correction and creates the biggest loss so here in this sentence the chazonish says a mouthful where he's telling you we've already established over the last several lectures the last several paragraphs that he's been teaching us that the only way for a person to develop themselves into being a better version of themselves a better wife a better husband a better son a better daughter a better teacher a better business person a better version of themselves the only way that they could possibly do that is by being particular about following the law which by default means learning the law but also by following the character trait development that's required to go along with it now if a person is going to follow this we already have established that this is the best way to correct the traits by following the law you're actually going to correct your trait because by being zealous for the mitzvot that automatically will eliminate your laziness your your lethargic personality will be eliminated because you have constant mitzvot to do constant opportunities to serve Hashem if a person is a uh, naturally inclined to do things that are the opposite of what people tell them following the law will obviously straighten that out because you have to follow God or you have to go to Ganom and face reality that you don't necessarily want to face so a person that is following the law is naturally going to fix their character traits by following all of these mitzvot and this is actually the reason why when Rabbi Chaim Ivalozin asked uh, the Gaon Vilna, why is it that God gave us 613 laws even though most of them are for the Bet HaMikdash that unfortunately we don't have anymore and we have to wait for the Mashiach to build half of those 613 are particular to the Bet HaMikdash part of them are particular to Kohanim part of them are particular just to women part of them just to men the point being is that very few out of the 613 are actually relevant to any one particular person call it about 10 percent now out of all of these mitzvot these Torah obligations we don't necessarily find any one particular of them telling us that we have to develop our character traits but yet the teachings of the sages Gaon Mivila included tell us that if a person does not develop himself does not develop herself to be a better version of themselves to eliminate the anger the pride the stinginess and so on then they were created for no reason meaning they haven't completed their tikkun they haven't completed their mission so if it's so important to develop your character traits why didn't Hashem just include a mitzvah say develop your character traits the Gaumi Vilna gives the exact response that the Chazonish has been teaching us but even in fewer words where he tells his Talmud the whole purpose of the mitzvot is to correct your character traits meaning there was no need to have a mitzvah to tell you to correct your character traits because that is the ultimate purpose of all of the mitzvot where if you follow all of the mitzvot that you're obligated to follow by default that is going to correct your character traits so here we see the chazunish telling us that if we follow the law we are going to go in the right path and little by little become a better version of ourselves but on the other hand if we don't he says that neglecting this observance is one of the things that prevents one from developing this correction and creates the biggest loss for anyone that's following for the Hebrew English this creating the biggest loss is only on the Hebrew vis- version I'm not really sure why the English version missed that part out where it says Amafsidot et patchut shel tikunim. so this creating the biggest loss what does it mean creating the biggest loss loss of opportunity to perfect yourself 
loss of opportunity to becoming a better version of yourself loss of opportunity of hearing your wife telling you you are the greatest husband in the world everyone should just simply be like you loss of opportunity from hearing your husband literally praise the steps you walk in because you have become the greatest wife in the world and not just because of your looks and not just because you produce babies because that other women can do also you do things that no one in the world does because you're so unique you've developed your character traits you care so much you do so much without asking for anything in return and so on and so forth by not developing your character traits you're creating the biggest loss the loss of opportunity but then he goes and it develops this and to letting us know that it actually creates an even further loss what is this further loss for whoever performs the mitzvot or refrains from transgressions habitually probably is aware that there are many details and rules of to these mitzvot and yet he refrains from seeking out a rabbi to consult about them there is no doubt that some of his traits are involved in this neglect so here the chazonish is telling us something that's all too relevant to our generation today where i've met countless amount of people that are religious have been religious their whole life some have been a ballet tshuva for many years and when i anytime i ask him who is your rabbi many times people are dumbfounded no i don't really have a rabbi when i have a local rabbi but i don't really tell him anything he's just a rabbi at my shul sometimes i'll learn gemara with him sometimes i'll learn such and such with him sometimes i'll listen to his shul okay but who's your rabbi who do you consult with whether you have business problems marriage problems oh well the marriage problems there's some rabbi in the community that we talk to him sometimes well is he a rabbi well not really well when you have business problems do you tell him no no i don't tell him about business problems so what do you tell him about i talk about the marriage problems okay so what about the business problems oh business problems usually i go to the lawyer are your lawyer is a rabbi no so how could your lawyer help your business problems well if i need to sue somebody or i'm being sued he can help me what you do realize that if that lawyer doesn't know halacha he could be the reason why you lose Allah and go to gain all right because just going with the civil law is not exactly the Jewish thing to do oh no I didn't know that well perhaps you should ask a rabbi and many times you see that people share specific information with some form of rabbi but it's really not their rabbi why they don't really know they don't really have an answer the Chazonish is going to give us the answer they don't really have an answer of why there are certain questions they ask the rabbi if they say uh, ask question listen rabbi is, is it Rosh Chodesh today or is it tomorrow is the holiday what time does the holiday start those questions they'll ask those questions they'll ask rabbi uh, what time is minyan they'll ask those questions rabbi uh what do you think about the brit milah should we have it at the hall and spend like twenty-five thousand dollars, or should we just do it at the synagogue and uh I don't know, maybe only you know donate like five hundred bucks to the shul? What do you think I should do, Rabbi? Uh, what's the basic questions? They'll ask the rabbi, but the real questions, the ones that require a person to disclose who they really are, those questions only a kadosh baruch Hu knows, and that's not the right way to do things. Why? Because a person knows that there are details to the law every law whether it's the laws of tzedakah or it's the laws of learning or it's the laws of marriage or it's the laws of of of, of raising children or it's the laws of how to pick a school or it's the laws of, of if even to go to school or it's the laws of uh you know uh anything else that you want these things have laws now a person that goes to a rabbi on a regular basis will always know what to do it doesn't necessarily mean they'll do what they need to do it just simply means they'll know right or wrong and every person that is from for a little while that's religious for, for a little while knows that there are not just general laws but there are letter, many many particular details about every single thing but yet the average person despite being aware that there are many details to these rules they refrain from seeking out the chacham the rabbi to consult about them why why would they why would they refrain from doing so the chazonish elaborates he says there is no doubt 
that some of his traits are involved in this neglect. So here the Chazonish is telling us the real reason. Why do most people not have a rabbi? And I don't mean just somebody to put on their shiduch resume that if anybody has any questions, they can call them even though the rabbi only knows their name and what school they attended and perhaps what family they belong to. Other than that, the rabbi doesn't really know much about this person unless they got into a lot of trouble and the whole community knows. Generally speaking, the rabbi doesn't know much about the marriage, doesn't know about the, uh, the kids, doesn't know much about anything. But yet, they have no problem telling people, yeah, that's my rabbi. But truth be told, most rabbis don't know because the people have certain traits that cause them to not disclose this information, cause them to not discuss this information, and cause them to avoid going to them to ask the most important questions. You know, people are always keen on asking the rabbis about what time the holiday begins, and when is Shabbat, and whether they should, uh, you know, have Sudash Lichit at home or at their in-laws, those types of questions they have. But if it's a big business deal, not so much. If it's a uh, lawsuit potential, not so much. Possible divorce, only after it's too late. One of the kids is off the derech, only once he's off the derech, far enough where you've lost hope yourself. Meaning that the most critical points that you're supposed to bring to your rabbi, people don't bring. Why? Many times it's because of their own traits. And those traits could actually be good traits that are causing them to do bad. Such as, for example, the common trait that people use, which is, listen, we all know that the rabbi is busy. Rabbi is busy. On top of him being busy, helping the community, I don't want him to waste his time on my little problems. It's bitul Torah for him. So you know what? I'll figure it out myself. I'll figure it out myself. I'll read a book. I'll meditate. You know, I'll ask a few friends. I don't want the rabbi to, you know, sin because of me, bitul Torah. All of a sudden, she's concerned about the rabbi's bitul Torah. But when it was time to naming the baby or what time is Minyan start, all these other things, no one really cares about the, uh, the rabbi's uh, uh, time. The meaningless things, the minor things, no one has any concern about the rabbi's time. Big things, all of a sudden, everyone's concerned about the rabbi being so busy. There's a very uh, well-known story about Rabbi Yashiv. Allah wa shalom. Rabbi Yashiv was known to be not only an extraordinary chacham and matmid, but also he did whatever he could to help the community. And everyone knew he would wake up in the middle of the night, somewhere around 2 o'clock in the morning, and begin his study session. Only after a few hours of sleep. And uh, one time, the Rav is already approaching 100 years old almost, and he is up at 2 o'clock in the morning, learning, and all of a sudden, someone knocking on the door. Now, he had some family members staying with him to take care of the rabbi. And, of course, they had to be around for, for where, when he was up. So they hear a knock on the door. Who's going to knock at 2 o'clock in the morning at anybody's house? Needless to say, at Rabbi Yashif's house. They figured it must be pikuach nefesh, life is Somebody needs to, you know, have a question answered. Perhaps somebody's life's on the line. Somebody uh, needs to be released from prison. Or, uh, you know, somebody has to decide whether to uh, pull the plug, not pull the plug. Something, you know, something extreme. They open the door and they see this guy sweating bullets. I, I, need, I need to speak to the Rav. I need to speak to the Rav right away. I said, okay, sure, sure, hold on a second. We see, oh, the Rav is already at his Gemara. It's two o'clock in the morning. He's already started. We'll get to him in a second. Oh, they bring the guy in. The guy sits down. And of course, the family is curious. What does he want at two o'clock in the morning, this guy? Rav Yashiv sits with him and says, yes. What can I do for you? And he says, Kula Rav, something really important right now. What do I name the baby? If I don't want to name him, one of the names in the Torah. This is the question that requires two o'clock in the morning attention. Rabbi Yashif didn't think twice. He figured the baby was born and perhaps he chose a name that's different than his wife or his wife chose a name different than him that's causing some marriage problems in order to 
create peace within the home no problem two o'clock in the morning so Rabbi Yashif says well you know one of the names of the Avot in the Tanakh is very good yeah, but what if I don't want someone in the, in the Torah what about the Tanakh the Tanakh has many other names you know the Nevi'im the Ketuvim David you know you have Shaul no 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 what, what if what if I don't I don't want that either okay well the, the oral Torah has the Gemara has many fantastic names you have Abaye Rava Rav Rav Chizda these are also good names you can name the boy now what about uh not there either what if I wanted to call him and he comes up with some strange name and Rabbi Yashiv says nah, I don't nah, you shouldn't do that what about th- this one nah, this one and they go back and forth 10 minutes 10 minutes of Rabbi Yashiv's time trust me when I tell you that was like a world but he gave the guy because he figured he is saving a home right now after 10 minutes of going back and forth the guy then says but for the love what if it's not gonna be a boy that's born what if it's a girl what do I name him then now here anybody with 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 normal midot would lose their mind why are you kidding me you tell me that the kid wasn't even born yet and you're already knocking on my door at two o'clock in the morning breaking my head over here trying to come up with a name because you don't want to name him after the names of the holy people in, the, in, our, in our Torah and it's not even bo- it's not even born it's not even relevant Rabbi, Rabbi um, Ayashiv thought the baby's born is gonna be a Brit Milah perhaps even tomorrow it's the seventh day already eight days tomorrow you know it's relevant this guy two o'clock in the morning apparently there's no concern whatsoever to the Bitul Torah of Rabbi Yashiv needless to say your average rabbi out there no one is concerned about their bitul Torah, them wasting time. Why? Because that particular question is a question I'm comfortable asking the rabbi and he could help me. But what about if it wasn't naming a baby? What about if you just found out that uh, your partner is uh, stealing from you? What if you just, uh, your partner found out that you're stealing from him? Would you come to the rabbi? Would you go then? Say what you really did? Or would you say, nah, you know what, let me just figure it out. Better yet, you're really hungry. You're in a new area, and you see there's a uh, Jewish restaurant. Looks good. You come inside, shawarma, burgers, all the good stuff. All right, want to eat? Wait, hold on a second. The rabbi told me, check the kashut. And you see on the wall pictures of tzaddikim, pictures of righteous people but you don't see a certificate of kashrut the guy behind the counter looks religious he's got a keeper even a little stubble on his face the kashrut not so much not really sure should I ask the rabbi if he knows this place maybe I should call the rabbi what if the rabbi doesn't answer he's busy all of a sudden you care about whether the rabbi is busy do you know why you care about if the rabbi is busy because you know that if the rabbi doesn't answer the phone that means you can't eat there that means you can't eat there if he doesn't answer the phone not if he answers the phone he tells you it's okay then you can eat but what if he answers the phone and says no then you know you can't eat but what if he doesn't answer the phone then you're still not sure well maybe he would have said yes maybe he knows this guy maybe this is Talmud maybe this maybe that so what does the guy figure out you know what he's religious I can trust him the guy's a, you know he's a hundred he looks like he was uh, born in Mount Sinai look he's got to keep on everything you know who's talking your belly's talking your belly's talking not your good inclination not your mind all of a sudden you could trust the guy would you trust the guy with a million dollar loan would you trust the guy to fund his business not so much why because now you have to check but all of a sudden you figured that since you're hungry the rabbi may not answer the phone so you know what you could just trust this religious guy and that is the logic of the evil inclination to tell you that uh, perhaps perhaps you can skip you can skip uh ask, asking the rabbi another uh example is a business transaction this is perhaps even more common somebody comes to you and says listen I uh I have a business opportunity for you you can make ton of money 50% on your money 100% on your money 
Oh, great. I like making 50%, 100% of my money. What do I got to do? What do I sign up? And he tells you all this mumbo jumbo business deal. And you figure, yeah, this sounds good. Wait, but over there, how, how do you actually make the money though? Ah, don't worry about that. That, we have a guy that's a specialist. He works for the government and he knows exactly how to get the government to send us the money. Wait, wait. Why do we need a specialist that works for the government? Oh, because what we're buying over there, it's not really worth that much. But the government doesn't pay any attention. So we have a guy on the inside. And in so many words, in five words, he just explained to you that the whole business investment is corruption. The whole business investment is a lie. It's a scam. But all of a sudden, you're like, wait, do I need to ask the rabbi? I mean, technically, it's a scam, but I'm not really involved in it. I'm just an investor. I'm not telling them what to do. I'm not, not really involved. I'm just, I'm just investing in a business. The business has a storefront. Look, they even have a picture of it. The guy looks religious. Everything looks good. Like, why, why do I have, why do I care if they have a guy? The, the real, you know what? I'm actually doing them a favor because maybe if they get my money and I help them make money, they'll even do legit business too. And he starts justifying all of this stuff. You know why? You know why he justified it? And he called the rabbi. Because he knows that if the rabbi has an ounce of Yirat Shemaim, he'll tell him it's not allowed. And if the rabbi doesn't answer the phone, it's also not allowed. And in reality, he himself knows it's not allowed. But maybe this one time, maybe I'm helping them, and he'll rationalize and rationalize every evil trait under the sun. Now, this is not just the general examples Sometimes these types of things come when a person has good traits where they're actually trying to do good. Where they have developed a certain generosity. They like to give. They like to give. And all of a sudden they decide that since they have and God blessed them, they should give. And they say to themselves, you know what? I'm in a mood of giving. I'm going to give to anything that looks good to me. And all of a sudden, some uh, Christian missionary knocks on their door, whether the digital door or their real door in their house, saying that they have a great cause. They're sending all of these missionary priests to Israel to bring the light to the Jews. And they really are trying to bring good and they're donating money to the poor people. And the fact that they're Christian missionaries and they're trying to pretty much murder everybody's soul is, you know, that's, we're not going to mention that part. We're just going to bring good and we're going to feed people and we're going to go and help the, 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 uh, uh, the victims of the Holocaust that survived and we're going to help the poor people. And he's thinking to himself, you know what? These Christians, after all, they're not so bad. Okay, so we have a different belief. But why wouldn't, why, not, why wouldn't I want to help them if they're going to my country, they're going to Israel, they're going to feed the poor Israelis, they're going to feed the uh, Holocaust survivors that are Jews, they're going to help the Jewish people. So why wouldn't I help the Christian church if they're, after all, going to help my people? And his good nature of generosity is justified according only to him. But if... You ask any posik, any rabbinical judge, any tomit chacham, whether such a thing is allowed, they'll run from this like they're running away from the Holocaust. Why? Anyone that knows enough about the operations of the missionaries in the church in general knows that whatever good they do in Israel comes with a price. What's the price? open door policy for their missionaries to try to recruit Jewish people and convert them to Christianity. They'll donate hundreds of millions of dollars in food and shelter and whatever they want just to have that open door where even during the coronavirus shutdown where literally people were not allowed to leave their houses in Israel it was much more strict in Israel than it was in many other countries, especially in the United States. In Israel, they didn't let anyone leave their house. The only place you were allowed to go for under strict supervision was to the store to get some food and come back home. And even that was difficult. Yet during this shutdown, multiple jumbo planes 
full of Christian missionaries were permitted to fly in to Israel and allow people to go in, allow the missionaries to go in. How? They made a lot of payments before coronavirus, which gave them that open door policy. Now, unfortunately, there are many people that we've spoken about in the past that have developed strong partnerships with the Christian church under the belief system, the, the unfortunately, the, the stupidity that they want to believe that the church actually means well. They're not looking to recruit anybody. They're not looking to missionize. But this, Rabotai, it didn't start with just evil people. This started with good intentions, probably on both sides. The church, some of the people there weren't really looking to missionize. They actually wanted to help the Jewish people because part of their belief system is to help the Jews. Now, of course, the leaders and many of their you know, little uh, tentacles that they have within the huge organizations, their, complete, their agenda is completely different. Their whole goal is to capitalize on this partnership, capitalize on this multi-million dollar investment and go and have this uh, missionizing door-to-door, building churches and all types of institutions to missionize to children, to missionize to adults, to missionize to the, uh, the poor, to missionize to the disabled, to missionize everywhere, of course. But some of the people that were part of the organization weren't really looking for that. They actually genuinely wanted to help the Jewish people. Same concept goes with some of the rabbinical figures, some of the Jewish figures. That said, you know what? Listen, there's a lot of poor people. Everyone knows there's at least a million children in Israel, according to the statistic of about almost maybe seven, eight years ago, a million children in Eretz Israel don't know the, the Shema Israel, but also don't have to go to, go to sleep hungry. Literally, an enormous amount of hunger in different areas in Israel. Poverty is standard for many people. This is part of the reason why our organization has tried very, very hard every year to have campaigns to feed the poor, to feed the people out there. Baruch Hashem, each year we've outdone ourselves, more and more people, but it's no easy feat. It's no easy uh, uh, venture. So these people behind on the Jewish side, said, you know what, listen, there's poverty there. We're not getting enough money from the Jewish people, apparently. If the Christians want to help us, why not? They meant well, too. Now, of course, some of the people on that side, too, said, listen, what do you guys want to donate? 50 million? Okay, I can broker that deal. Under the condition. What's the condition? I get a 5, maybe 7% commission. Let's just call it 10. So it's round. Nobody forgets. And this guy gets a commission. And that guy gets a commission. By the time it gets to the poor people, maybe 10% is left. But the guy that, you know, in there somewhere, that good guy that actually wants to help the good people, has no idea that these evil people behind it are brokering the deals and selling it to that one and selling it to that one. And there's also some, uh, some uh, dotted lines that somebody signed that said open door policy everywhere. He doesn't know. He meant well. So his generosity, his desire to help led to evil. Why? Because he didn't follow the law. He rather followed his own intuition, his own inclination, his own desire to do good. And the Chazunish tells us, you have to understand, your desire to do good is not always going to lead to good. Because sometimes that desire to do good is coming from the Sitra Achra. It's coming from the Yetzirah, the evil inclination. He's going to lead you to do a mitzvah for his sake. For his sake. He's going to tell you, now nah, you don't need to bother the rabbi. He's too busy. Why? For his sake. For the Satan's sake. Don't, uh, don't worry about all these people telling you not to do business with the uh, idol worshippers. They mean well. For his sake. Don't worry about inviting the missionaries to your, uh, to your synagogue. Even though the rabbi said it's not allowed. Even though Bedin said it's not allowed. Even though everyone said it's not allowed. Don't listen to anybody. Why? Because they mean well. They, they, they're good speakers for APEC. And the Jewish Federation loves them. And ignore the halacha. Ignore the law. And unfortunately, Rabbi 
those good traits end up with evil outcomes. Now, the Chazoni says that there is no doubt that some of his traits are involved in this neglect, where sometimes a person will simply be too proud to call the rabbi. Too proud. Why? He figures, listen, the rabbi is smart. I'm smart too. The rabbi studies. I study too. The rabbi has the books. I have the books too. So why should I bother the rabbi? Why don't I just read the books, figure out what to do, and I'll do that. That pride is going to be his footsteps to Gano many times. Why? Who said you understood it well? Who said you understood it correctly? Now, the Chazunish elaborates further and says, the habit of going along with one's natural tendencies in our positions to moral obligations strengthens the Sitra Achra, the other side. Here, the Chazonish gives us a little bit of insight into an unknown secret about him. Many people in the Litvish Ashkenazi world have shied away from the teachings of Kabbalah since Shabtai Tzvi. Caused a disaster, a false messiah, a lot of problems in, in the world. And even though Shabtai Tzvi himself was uh, Sephardic, the most amount of damage that he caused was in the Ashkenazi world. And many other machlokets, till this day, there is uh, problems from the outcomes of, of his evil actions. And many Ashkenazim have actually shied away from the world of Kabbalah, mysticism, but of course a select few have delved very, very deep into it. One of them was the Leshem. The Leshem was the grandfather of Rabbi Yashiv. Leshem was Rav Shlomo El Yashiv. He was a huge Mekubal, one of the greatest Kabbalists of his age. And one of his Talmidim was Asandla Kadosh. Asandla Kadosh, his name was Rav Yosef Rabikov. And he was an extraordinary tzaddik that Rav Kuk actually said in a conversation to uh, Rav Aryeh Levin that certainly the Sandla Kadosh is one of the 36 holy tzaddikim that the whole world stands on in his time. The Gemara tells us that any given time there are 36 hidden tzaddikim that the world exists because of them. And the Sandla was one of them. He was a big Mekubal, a Kabbalist, but had the image of a simple man. He had like a shoe, shoe repair. And in fact, uh, just a few years ago, maybe uh, three, four years ago, some of his repair tools and a kamea that uh, was a kamea for, uh, to help uh, women that uh, had uh, difficulty giving birth or getting pregnant was sold in a uh, auction for, uh, for a pretty penny. Anyway, the Sadla Kadosh was an extraordinary mekubal at Sadiq and uh, the Chazonish was one of his Talmidim. So even though the Chazonish, Alakha, 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 and Musa and everything, he also was actually himself a huge Mekubal. Many people don't know the Chazonish was a Mekubal. And he delved into the teachings of Kabbalah, the, the stuff, the mystical parts, the things that many people shied away from because, again, it's not for everybody. Now, this Sandlar also had a uh, Gilu Eliyahu, where Eliyahu and Avi came to him and it was even publicized in a newspaper at the time. So the Chazonish tried to get the Sandlar Kadosh to tell everybody who he is and other Talmidei Chachamim that studied with him also wanted him to tell people who he is, but he shied away from it. Still, he got enough attention where everyone knew that he is uh, an extraordinarily holy man. But uh, no one understood how great he was other than his Talmidim, one of them being the Chazonish. And the Chazonish here is telling us in between the lines that the greatest loss 
that a person will experience as a result of counting on their own natural tendencies against the moral obligations, against their obligations in the Torah, counting on their intuition, counting on their own logic. The greatest loss will be that what they do will be the food that strengthens the sitra acha, the opposite side, the satan. Those mitzvot, those good deeds, those good intentions will lead to evil that will strengthen the evil. And that evil will turn that simple deed into mayhem. You know, there were some people that started a partnership with the church years ago. Today, these partnerships have given the church open door policy in Israel to such an extent that about a year ago, the largest food distributing company in Israel, Food to the Poor, run by this church, admitted that their number one intention is to missionize and bring the Jews to their Yoshke. Meaning it's such an open door that they have no problem admitting what they're, uh, what they're doing anymore. And unfortunately, this is not the only partnership. There are many others just like it, whether it's in the wine business, this organization called Ayuvel, run by a well-known missionary. Everyone knows he's a missionary, but still they do business with him. Why? It's already, it's already gone uh, into the bloodstream of the people that are profiting from it. It's too hard for them to leave. Now, how could all of these things happen? Someone skipped the step of asking the rabbis. Someone skipped the step of following the Allah. Someone skipped the step and simply followed their own natural tendencies. And their own natural tendencies led to some horrible things. And that's when the Chazonish finalizes that particular point and says that instead of having the means to correct traits, one is constantly using those traits that prevent them from developing. What good will the study of all the correctional means do if one uses all the corrupting means against them? Meaning you have developed some of these good traits. You're more generous. You're uh, more, uh, uh, you know, your mind is more developed. You've learned this, you've learned that. You know that you need to do good in order to be good. What good is that? If that good is corrupted with the way that you're you're using that good and turns into evil. Now a person may not think that what he or she is doing is evil until they see the outcome. But the Chazoni says you don't need to see the outcome. If you didn't follow the law itself, if you didn't have the rabbinical supervision for all the different things that you need, if you didn't have the clarity of the Allah itself allowing you to do everything that you're doing and also the Ashkafa that allows you to do everything that you're doing, you could be sure that at some point or another that will turn into something bad. Now, one of the examples that we can bring is the desire that people have to simply absolve everybody from sin. In today's world, very few rabbis in the English-speaking world tell people the truth about what happens to people after they die, Needless to say, what is the status, halachic status, of a Jew that does not follow the Torah, does not observe Shabbat? Why don't they tell people? Because they're not comfortable or they simply don't want to. 
Now, when somebody is approached about this and they're a rabbi, he told him, listen, you have a synagogue over here, 30 years, 40 years, but yet the majority of the keilah still drives on Shabbat. The majority of the keilah still doesn't observe Shabbat. You have 150 people, not even 10 of them are observing Shabbat, means you don't even have a minyan. And unfortunately, many times the rabbis will tell people, no, nah, no, you don't really understand, you don't really know, you don't this, you don't that. Now this is bad enough. The worst part is that these rabbis today, because of the media, because of YouTube and Torah Anytime and all the other uh, places where people can watch rabbis speak, these rabbis can always find somebody to uh, support whatever nonsense they came up with. And one of the places that, uh, let's just say, worked hard to get our attention, worked hard to try to uh, tell people not to listen to us, celebrated, celebrated when they saw a clip, a video clip by... Rav David Yosef, the son of Rav Ovadia, tell a story where he said when he was younger, they were walking in the street, him and his father, Rav Ovadia, the family, and they saw some secular Jew driving by, and he stopped right next to them. And he said, hey, which way to go to such and such place? And Rav David Yosef, still a young man, a little zealous, said to him, that way to gain on, or something like that. Now after he did that, the guy obviously didn't like what he said, and drove away, and rebuked him. That's not how you talk to people. So from that clip, and if I could find it, I'll put this clip on this, uh, on this video for people to watch when they see this video again. He was a little child, I remember. I was going with my father back from the synagogue home, Shabbat. Shabbat, 11 o'clock in the morning, we were walking in Jerusalem. Suddenly, a car stopped next to me. And the driver, Jewish, asked me, this street is going to well. I told him to well, directly to Gainam. <laughs> So everybody was laughing, but my father, wow, he was very, very angry. He told me, why, why, why did you do that? Why did you say that? What do you think? He heard he's going to Gehinnam, he will get panicked, he will stop driving, he will make Teshuvah. No, the opposite. He will hate the religion because of you. This is a way to talk to people, to tell him, you are going to Gehinnam. And I'm telling you, Rabotai, if we try to make Baalei Teshuvah, to tell them, you are going to Gainam, Reshaim, Hashem will kill you, Hashem will burn you, you will be... Uh, what will happen? Zero. No one Baal Teshuvah. That was the way that Noah was walking. What he told people? You are going to die. Hashem is going to kill you. It will be flood. You will die. Yeah. Eh, who cares about him? He is not normal, people thought. So, if we want to make Baalet Shuvah, it's like Hashem told Noah. You had to have tears. He was crying. Hashem told him, if you cried before, I will not bring the flood. It means if you cry, if he was crying, people would listen to him. And so, no reason to have the flood. From that clip, multiple organizations celebrated as if the son of Rabbi Vadya just gave permission for everyone to desecrate Shabbat, for everyone to never talk about Gehenom, for everyone to simply never rebuke.
joke for everyone to simply don't say anything let them do whatever they want they're all tinok shenishba they're all captured babies they don't know any better the worst part is that this whole campaign was spearheaded by rabbis using this video misusing this video with that message and you know how many messages I've gotten practically every year since that video have come out I've gotten a bunch of people send me this video oh rabbi you always talk about judgment you always talk about genom you always talk about Michalel Shabbat goes to genom look look Rab W. Yosef is saying uh he got rebuked by his father for saying such a thing maybe you should need to change your ways my rabbi such and such said I should send this to you is what I get sometimes now of course we don't change the Torah just because of videos needless to say we don't learn the Torah from a short video we learn Torah from the books and anyone that would have learned Torah from the books would have simply said you misunderstood the story now I already knew the story and I knew that they misunderstood the story so the story did nothing for me I already knew the story and I knew what Ravavadya meant which is yes you need to rebuke but not that way not that way the guy is telling you where can I go why don't you tell the guy listen come out here let's talk outside maybe you could uh uh observe Shabbat perhaps invite him for lunch well you know what instead of going there come with us sweet talk him try to get him out of the situation that he's in or at the very least invite him to a shield Torah do something don't just attack the guy with something that he can do nothing with you're telling the guy he's going to get home and that's it he doesn't even know why maybe the guy doesn't know why look that's just not a good response don't talk to people that way sure a person that desecrates your body is going to go to gain home but if you're going to say that only say it after you gave some context of why that's what Rabbi Vadya meant not don't mention gain home and everybody's allowed to desecrate Shabbat but of course the heretics the Shaim that run some of these organizations love this clip and love misusing it because it's in English and they love to mislead the English-speaking public well my dear English-speaking public you're fortunate enough to have Rav Avadia actually write many books and if you learn from his books you'll see he has the answer not only does he have the answer but he even has of David Yosef quoted in it in his famous Yabia Omil in the tenth Perik, the tenth uh, volume in Ora Chaim Siman Nun Hei Ot Yud Alif the Rav Ovadia elaborates on the point of whether a person a Jew the desecrate Shabbat such as driving on Shabbat smoking cigarettes on Shabbat uh, working on Shabbat and the like is he considered a goy lechol davar if he's considered an idol worshiper according to all opinions just like the Rambam Paskins in Ilchot Shabbat uh, chapter 30 Allah number 15 uh, or like many of the ones that he's mentions here is he considered an idol worshiper according to all opinions and he starts off this by saying bringing the sources anyone that read any of the work by Rav Vadya knows that you're never going to be short on sources literally an endless amount of sources everything is reviewed both the supporting opinion and the contrary opinion and he starts off by saying what the Ben Ishchai wrote about how someone at a Jew that desecrates Shabbat Befaresia in public cannot be counted in a minyan just like it was written in the prime gadim he cannot be counted for a kedusha you cannot say kaddish with him and, and consider his amen and this is also what the shulchan aruch said in uh, siman nun hey and see if uh, yud alef also the uh bet yourself same exact thing also the uh uh Chaim. and many others 
that talked about how someone that desecrates a Jew that desecrates Shabbat is considered 100% like an idol worshiper, halachically speaking, which means that if you want to have a Jewish ceremony, such as a wedding, you need two witnesses, that Michalal Shabbat cannot be counted as one of them. If he is, that wedding, that chuppah is null and void. They're not considered married. If you have to pray, you need 10 people in order to take out the Torah, in order to say Kaddish, in order to say Kedusha. If one out of those 10 people is a Mechalel Shabbat, you're not allowed to take out the Torah, to say Kaddish, to say Kedusha. Why? You do not have 10 people. Yeah, but he's 10, but he, you know, he's, uh, he keeps the holidays. Doesn't make a difference. He desecrates Shabbat. He's considered an idol worshiper. You have a court hearing. You need a witness. One of your witnesses that saw exactly what happened is a Mechalel Shabbat. You cannot use him as a witness. Why? He's not trustworthy. Why? Just because he drives on Shabbat? Yes, just because he drives on Shabbat. You have a slaughterhouse. You want to make kosher food. The guy that's the best slaughterer in the world. Best. Everybody knows his skill is second to none. He's Mechalel Shabbat. Everything he cuts is taref. No one's allowed to eat it. Why? It's considered not kosher just because he cut it. Even if you watched him the whole time. So the halachic treatment of someone, a Jew that desecrates Shabbat, is severe. Needless to say, if he dies, a Mechalel Shabbat, he goes to Gehenom, the seventh chamber, and he never comes out. So now, there are many people that want to tell you, yeah, but you know, the uh, some rabbis disagreed, and they said that, uh, you know, that uh, really we're just a generation of Tinok Shenishba. We're all like captured babies. And you know, just like the Rambam brought it, where he said the, the children of the Karaites, even if, uh, you know, you meet them, you should help them do Chuba because they're really Tinok Shenishba. Rav, what do you know about this? Yeah, but you know that the, uh, the Igrot Moshe said that you really, you can count them for Minyan. Yes, the Igrot Moshe, you also brought that too. Rav Moshe Feinstein, by the way, and Igrot Moshe, in Ora Chaim, in Siman 23, he doesn't say that you're allowed to count them in Minyan. He says you're allowed to use them for Kaddish. Not because they're not considered Goim. Not because they're not considered idol worshippers. No. But rather because we have a special Gzerat uh, HaKatuv, uh, learning that we got from the writings, of, from the spies, where they were heretics also, the Meraglim, but also considered as a, uh, uh, considered like a minyan, ten. So the Rav Moshe Feinstein says, from there we know that even heretics can complete a, a quorum of ten. Rav Tzion doesn't agree with this, and he says, no, the uh, spies weren't really considered heretics according to all opinions, and that means that you cannot really use that as a uh, source to say that you can't use a Michalel Shabbat uh, uh, as part of a minyan. Therefore, no. But needless to say, Rav Moshe Feinstein still says that a Mechalel Shabbat is considered an idol worship according to all opinions. He doesn't change that part. You still can't use them as a witness. You can't, still can't use them as a uh, uh, slaughterer or anything like that. He just wanted to be lenient on one aspect based on this teaching, but many disagreed with him. But of course, anyone that didn't learn the books will say anything they want to say, as if Rav Moshe Feinstein said that everybody's a Tinok Shanishba and everybody could get an Aliyah and everybody could be uh, the Chazan even. But he didn't say that. And even if you want to find somebody said, yeah, but uh, they said that uh, we're Tinok Shemishba, we're a captured baby, so maybe that's the case. So first, the Rav says, look at how many poskim have mentioned how a Mechalel Shabbat is considered 100% an idol worshiper. If he's a Jew, he desecrates Shabbat on purpose, he drives on Shabbat, uh, not to go save a life. Simply on a regular basis, he drives to the mall, he drives to the synagogue, he drives to work, wherever he does. He's considered Mechalel Shabbat. He's considered 100% idol worshiper. Once he does tshuva, he's considered 100% a Jew, and he can fix all of those sins in the past. But until then, you cannot use him for those special Jewish ceremonies. 
now we live in a generation where many people want to come and tell you okay we know what it says but since there is the tinok shenishba clause which is a generation of captured babies which really the original teaching for that comes from the Gemara Masechet Avodah Zarah where in the uh previous generations almost uh, 2000 years ago the uh many uh, uh Jewish babies were captured by the Goim and raised as Goim raised as non-Jews raised as Christians many times more times than not and other uh, uh um, cultures and religions so they didn't know they were Jews so he said oh if the kid grows up not even knowing he's Jewish of course Hashem is not going to judge him like he's a Jew which is correct but then they want to take that teaching and say that this is the same thing as people today who didn't grow up religious or they simply grew up uh not going to a religious school they went to public school like I did and um since they didn't grow up religious their fathers are not rabbis their mothers are not rabbis since uh and they simply have too many desires they lived in the world because of that they should all be considered also the same thing as a captured baby from 1500 2000 years ago and what do they say look we have some uh, big post scheme that say that's the case Ravavadia goes over all of that and after he tells you about how if the Mechale Shabbat everyone knows that he's considered an idol worshiper now let's deal with the ones that say Tinok Shanishba he says and even though it starts with the word Omnam Omnam Beshut Melamed Le'oil the even though it says in the uh, Sefer Melamed Le'oil Shamin Ag Be Ashkenaz Vegam Be Ungaria that the custom in Ashkenaz and Hungary to be lenient in regards to including the Mechalel Shabbat Befaresia to the Minyan because many do not know how bad the uh, the uh, uh, the sin is and therefore they conclu- they are paskin as if they are Tinok Shenishba and they even say the same thing in America that in America they don't uh they're not accustomed to uh cancel out the Mechalel Shabbat Befaresia and they even include them in Minyan because they consider them Tinokot Shenishbu Ben Akum he says even though there are some poskim that say that some customers are saying that despite that all of that was already dealt with by who other than his dear son Rav David Yosef where he says at the end of the paragraph he already addressed all of these Tinokot Nishbu but now the Rav Avadya Paskins himself tells you exactly what the conclusion is as far as how to consider all of everybody's Tinok Shenishba. Anyone that says Tinok Shenishba, Tinok Shenishba, this place, that place, whatever your custom is, all that good stuff. He says the following Olam, Kol Ze Shayar Bim Komot Anidachim, Shen Sham Yadut, Verov Kikola Tushvim Akum. He says, All of this talk about Tinok Shenishba captured babies is only relevant to places that are as if you know completely empty of Judaism where the vast majority of the people that live there are not Jews non-Jews but don't say such a thing places that are ours where the people that live there see that there are uh, synagogues and uh uh yeshivot bet midrash and their eyes see that there's religious jews in the community that are following the ways of hashem shomre shabbat ke'alacha who see people that are observing shabbat ken yirbu ubechol zot enam nitraim bilchalel shabbat befaresha yesh ledunam ke'akum 
And despite seeing the synagogues and the yeshivot and the Jewish community and people that are observing Shabbat, despite seeing this, they still don't observe Shabbat. Their judgment is they are considered idol worshippers. Meaning, all this talk about, hey, this guy didn't grow up in a Jewish community, or this guy didn't grow up in yeshiva, and his father is not the Rambam, and his mother is not the Rebetzin Kanievsky, and this and that, and he doesn't know, and he doesn't this. Hey, hey, listen, does he have a synagogue in his community? Has he ever seen one? Does he ever, has he ever seen religious Jews? Has he ever seen them keep Shabbat? Has he seen them walk around with the lulav? Has he seen them walk around with the kippah, with the beard? Has he seen Jewish people before? Yes, yeah, of course, there's a bunch of them everywhere. Also, he knows what Jewish people are. He knows what religious people are. He's no longer Tino Shnishba. The only place that he can possibly be a Tino Shnishba, says Rav Ovadia, and you be a Omer, is if he lives among the Goim to such an extent where if he sees a Jew, he can't tell the difference between him and a non-Jew. He cannot tell the difference between him and a non-Jew. Why? There's no Beit Midrash. There's no synagogue. There's no nothing. And in fact, actually, almost forgot, in his Sefer Ilchot Olam, Rav Ovadia also comments on the Ben Ishchai, adds more to what the Ben Ishchai here said, about how a Jew that's a Mechalel Shabbat is considered an idol worshiper. And he says also that according to the Halakha, obviously a Jew is not allowed to lend another Jew money with interest. But if that Jew is a Mechalel Shabbat, you're allowed to charge him interest. Why? He's considered the non-Jew. He's considered a Gentile. Now, of course, it still has to be reasonable rates. You can't charge the guy 50, 100% like these evil cash advance businesses are doing to society today. But needless to say, you could treat this person that's a Jew by birth or conversion, but he doesn't follow the law. He doesn't keep Shabbat. You can treat him as if he's an idol worshiper. Charge him interest. That's what Rav Vadya writes in his Sefer Ilchot Olam. In Chelek Chet Amud Vav. In fact, our own Rosh Kolel in Eretz Yisrael, Rav Shlomo Sharvit, is not the shame, we're going to be publishing his Sefer very soon. He's a Gaon, Dayan, genius. He's coming out with a Sefer, is not the shame. And he paskins with endless amount of sources that, in fact, a case that came to him. At the Bet Din, somebody, a Jew that was a Mechalel Shabbat, lent money to another Jew that observes mitzvot. The Mechalel Shabbat died. He died. Now, whatever is his, the, uh, the family inherits, the kids, whatever, inherit. Now, one of the things that this person that died had was that he had a loan that he gave to a Torah observant Jew. So the Torah observant Jew came to the Beddin and asked, do I have to give money to his family that I owed him? Psaq alakha, you don't have to give money back. Why? The Mechalel Shabbat. It's considered as if he lost it and you don't, you're not obligated to return something that was lost by an idol worshiper. This is, Rabotai, a clarification of what Allah is. Now you're going to have many people say, wait, that's not nice. You're going to push them away. No, 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 Habibi. By telling people the truth, it's not pushing them away. It's letting them know where they stand. As, as Rabbi Ephraim says, be like a doctor. When it comes to talking to people, be like a doctor. A doctor has to do things that are uncomfortable. You show up at the doctor, something hurts. What does the doctor tell you? Get undressed. Get undressed. Now, if you have an ounce of modesty in you, you don't want to get undressed in front of strange people. Who wants to get undressed? 
Worse yet, he tells you to get undressed and get into strange positions. Move your leg this way, move your arm that way, let me see here. He starts touching this, touching that. It's uncomfortable. Why is he doing this to me? Because he's trying to save your life. Same concept here, Rav Ephraim says. Same concept here, needless to say, even more so here. Yes, telling people that a Mechalel Shabbat is considered an idol worshiper is not comfortable. But if it's going to save their life once they know where they stand, then obviously this is a great chesed that you're doing for them. But yet you will find many, many organizations and rabbis tell people that, hey, don't tell people that the Mechalel Shabbat goes to Gainom forever. Don't tell them that. You're going to turn them off. How do you turn off something that's not even on? I don't know. You look at their success ratio of how many people they actually help do tshuva. If they got to 10 after 25 years, it's an achievement in their standards. I once spoke to a rabbi like this when I was in Canada. He was proud of the fact that in, uh, I think it was 20 years or so that he was doing Kiruv, he helped like 10 people become Torah observant. He thought it was an achievement. Yes, saving 10 people is great, but 20 years? It's not even one per year. You're supposed to do that, you could do that today, 10 per day, if you're active enough and honest enough. And Baruch Hashem, thousands and thousands of people are following the truth. But yet they're going to tell you that, but, but you're too strong, you're telling them about Genom, maybe, maybe they don't know, maybe this, maybe that. And they're going to argue with me about Genom. Now, of course, we made a whole movie about anyone that wants to learn about Genom. But as I told you last week, there's a few so-called rabbis that have taken on the initiative to try to disprove the video. How do you disprove 172 Torah sources? I'm not sure, but apparently they're trying. So we're just going to give them another one. Now, many people will tell you, listen, Yes, we know that there is reward and punishment, and we know that there's gain on, but it's not so bad, like you say, as if I make this stuff up. It's just embarrassment. It's just uncomfortable. Let's see. This week's parasha, parashat bo. Go to Midrash Rabbah. Parashat tetvav. Always provide sources because it's the only way you know that we have something to stand on. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives us some clarifications about the creation. And it says the following. Ubo bayom bara genom. The, uh, oh, so it says, Mishe bara rakia bara melachim bayom ashitni. This is all based on the commentary on the Teilim, on, on Psalms 104.4, that says he makes winds his messengers, the flaming fire is attendance. So from the section that says flaming fire is attendance, the Midrash says there's a lot to learn from here. Where it says, after Hashem created the firmament, He created the angels on the second day of creation. Why did He create the angels on the second day? Why, why the second day? So people don't confuse that if he created them on the first day that they were actually partners in creation. But what's the connection of angels and uh, this verse? It says that the, uh, his attendants are the angels. Meaning that Hashem transforms the angels into winds and into fire at his will. So the Midrash says, for this verse is also interpreted to mean he turns his angels into winds, his attendants into flaming fire. And what is a uh, Hashem making flaming fire as attendants? What is uh, what's elaborate on that? It says on that very day that Hashem created Genom, the flaming fire that serves as attendants, meaning the flaming fire is referring to the fire of Genom. Because it was only the fire of Genom that was created on the second day. Whereas the area of Genom 
was created before the world. And where do we see this written? For we see that the expression and Hashem saw that this was good, that's written in the Torah on every day, that the scripture uses with regards to the other days of creation, it's not written within regards to the second day. If you notice, at the end of the first day, Hashem says it was uh, evening, it was morning, and the first day, you know, Hashem saw everything was good, third day was good, fourth day was good, and so on. Second day, Hashem does not say it was good. On the third day, He says it was good twice. But the second day, there was no good. We see from there that since Hashem did not say that it was good, that this was the day that Hashem created the fire of Gehenom. And now the Midrash explains the creation of Gehenom with a parable. Anyone that learns enough Torah, whether it's Gemara or Midrashim or anything else, knows that any time one of the sages explains something with a parable, they are addressing a issue that they already know is going to happen, which is people misunderstanding. People misunderstanding or, you know, because the issue is complex or because the issue is contrary to your natural inclination, your natural thought process. So they use a, 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 a parable in order to clarify the issue. It's just like saying, you want to describe to somebody, hey, listen, you know, Australia, it's a beautiful place. It has the mountains. It has the seas. And the guy's, mountain seas. You know, it has the hills and this and the valleys and it. Oh, okay, you know what? See those mountains? Yeah, like that. Oh, okay, okay. You see that beach over there? Yeah, it's like that, but just times it by a thousand. Oh. Oh, okay. That's it. That's what, that's what the parable do. So the parable is says this is similar to a human of flesh and blood who purchases servants and says to his attendants, prepare a sword. And the attendants ask him, why? Why do we need to prepare a sword? And he replies to them so that if the servants rebel against me, they will hear the death sentence. Similarly, the Holy One, blessed is He, said, I am creating Gehenom, regarding which it is not written that it was good, so that if people sin, they will descend into it. In so many words, why did Hashem say fire? Why did Hashem specifically not put the word good? Why all this stuff? So people know if they sin, there's a place of fire, there's a place of judgment, there's a place where... A person will suffer endlessly if necessary. Now, the Midrash asks another question and says, where do we know that Gehenom was created on the second day of creation? Maybe it was created a different day. It says, we have this also. From the, the uh, uh, prophets tell us, one of the sources is Isaiah chapter 30, verse 33, where the prophet says in the name of Hashem, for Tafteh, Meaning Gehenom is a Dafte is one of the names of Gehenom. Tafte is the comes from the word of um, uh, Pitui. Pitui, like a uh, someone was seduced, seduced into a sin. For Tafte has been prepared from yesterday. This is uh, Isaiah chapter thirty, verse thirty-three. So meaning that Gehenom has been prepared from the day during which a person can say yesterday, but not the day before yesterday. So from there we know when a person is able to say yesterday, the first time a person can say yesterday is the second day of creation. Now he can say yesterday on the third, the fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth day, and any other day. But the first time he can say yesterday is the second day of creation. And he cannot say that on the first day of creation because there wasn't yesterday on the first day of creation. So here, the literally, every little word, every little word in the Torah is analyzed with a microscope thereby allowing us to have all the confidence in the world to know what the truth is and fight for it so when people tell you no i think the maximum judgment is 12 months there's answers that say otherwise not just logical answers but outright scriptural answers go to parashat korach 
Parashat Koach outright says that Koach and his followers are in Gainom until this day. That's obviously more than a year has passed since Koach sinned. 3,334 years, he's still in Gainom. In fact, the Gemara that was written about 1,500 years ago, one of the Chachamim went by in the desert when one of the uh, Arab people over there showed him exactly where he hears screaming from the ground. He went over there, he heard Koach speak, screaming out. Moshe is emet, the Torah is emet, and we are liars. 2,000 years after the punishment, he's still in Ganom screaming. So obviously we know that judgment is not for a year and it's just uncomfortable and all this mumbo jumbo that people make up. Why do they make it up? Because they don't want to scare you. Because maybe, maybe you're, 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 too, you're, too, uh, you're too innocent to be scared. Maybe you're, you're too small to be scared. You're like an infant, 49-year-old infant, 50-year-old infant, 25-year-old infant. What about the fact that they like to watch scary movies and are willing to pay hundreds of millions of dollars just to produce scary movies because the public consumes them like Tic Tacs? Yeah, but maybe they don't like to be scared. What about the fact that the most popular games in the world today are shooting games where people are killing people? Yeah, but maybe they don't like to be scared. What about the fact that the most common games today in sports are violent games? Yeah, but they don't like violence. What about the fact that the most popular movies are action movies that have endless violence? For that, no one says anything. But the punishment that HaKadosh Baruch Hu decreed and said, I need to have this Gehenom. And I need my children to know about Gehenom. Why? Once they know that Gehenom exists and what it entails and who goes there, that will at least slow them down when it comes to their sins. If not, stop their sins altogether. But yeah, you have these wicked people that call themselves rabbis that will minimize judgment, minimize Gehenom, minimize the truth. Why? Because they want good for you. They don't want to scare you. The truth is that fear is the number one, number one thing that drives people to do what they do. People get married because of fear of being alone. People get a job, fear of, of poverty. People drive the speed limit, fear of getting a ticket, losing their license, getting into accidents. People eat healthy because of fear of getting sick and dying. The number one driving force of why people make decisions is fear. But yet, the evil inclination, the Satan himself has convinced an entire generation of rabbis to not speak fear. Why? They don't want to scare people. They want them to love God. Sure, love God all you want, but you still need to be afraid of Him. Because love in itself is not going to stop you from committing all the heinous crimes that people commit. Now, the next part that people are being poisoned by today is telling you this heretical thought process that God needs you. This, of course, was spearheaded by Manus Friedman, Imach Shimo, and now he has little minions that have followed the footsteps doing the same exact thing, some of them taking it to a different avenue altogether, saying, God needs you, and God loves everybody, and even starting to say things against the Torah. One guy made even a video saying that uh, Ishmael was really good, he was Baal Chesed, even though it's exactly the opposite of what the Torah says, what the Zohar says, what the Gemara says, what Chazal say. This guy decided that Ishmael was good. It was about chesed. He was great. Another guy decides to say, no, no, God needs you. It's not really heretical because we're not really talking about the real ultimate God. We're talking about parts of it. Listen, you ask any questions, you say, is there any sources on this thing? No, no, yeah, there's no, no, yeah, no, no. Is there a source? They start throwing book titles at you. Oh, yeah, if you look at the Shla Kadosh and you look at uh, this one and that one, that's not a source has a page number. A source has clarification. They just throw names at you as if this is all little pamphlets. Give a page number. Give a specific verse. Give anything. But they don't have that. 
What do they have? Insults. Ah, you don't know what you're talking about. Maybe you need to go to a real rabbi and ask him because obviously you don't understand. I'm not, maybe I don't understand. All I'm asking you for is can you give me the book with a page number of what, who says what you said? You said God needs you, right? Give me a book that says what you said. A book, one book. Give it to me. What do they give you? Insults. Public insults. Now, what about the fact that God loves you and you're supposed to love everybody and what, how, how come the public insults? What do you need the public insults for? They're trying to build themselves a stage. Like the Tower of Babel. But you see, Rabotai, I've given you many sources about how there's no such thing as God needs you. And even those that want to think that God benefits from anything that we do, like when it says in our prayer, give oz la Hashem, give uh, uh, a uh, power to Hashem. That's not because Hashem needs it. It's that when you glorify His name, His name is recognized by more people. It's not because He needs to be glorified. This is not coming from a need or lacking. It's just that your purpose is to glorify his name it's not that he needs it or benefits from you glorifying his name you benefit you are fulfilling your purpose as of doing it and that's why one of the rishonim a thousand years ago the rabbenu bachye writes clearly in shara bitachon this precedes any of the sources any of these heretics said says clearly one should be conscious of god's abundant goodness to man how in his great kindness and grace he raised him on this good without his deserving and not out of any need to do so but rather as a gift a favor and a grace here rabbeinu bachye says in shara bitachon peregimen the sixth tr- uh, a section that as far as the creation God creating you in very simple Hebrew English and I'm sure if it was translated to Cantonese also in that language God does not need you he will never need you he created you purely as a gift for your benefit if you can give me one source not ten because we've provided dozens one source that says a statement as clear as this to the contrary you got yourself some type of leg to stand on with these bold statements but do they no what do they have insults and the appearance that they mean well the appearance that they're trying to benefit the public by giving them the truth to benefit the public to make them feel good that the mighty God needs them what kind of God needs his creation he's not a God if he needs you who's gonna serve a needy God if you act needy your own wife doesn't want you if you act needy your husband doesn't need you nobody wants to to be next to a needy person you're telling me that the Almighty God needs you? And they say it with such zeal and such confidence that the audience just eats it up like Oreo cookies, kosher for Pesach. Why? They don't know any better. The rabbi said it. I believe it. This is why Rav Elchanan Wasserman said, don't trust the shepherds. Trust the sources. Trust the Torah itself, what it says. Somebody says something to you, doesn't sound good, doesn't sound kosher, even if it does sound kosher, even if it does sound good, what's the source? Give me the page number. Give me, show me this in a book. Let me check what you said with some other rabbis. Let me see if they agree with you. No, no, let me call them. I'll talk to them for you. No, no, no. I'll do it. I'm a grown up. I can go do it myself. Just tell me the source. Tell me the page number. Oh, no, maybe they won't understand. Wait, for if it's so clear, how come you're the only one that ever said it? How come you're the only one that understands it? What? You're telling me that the Rambam, Ramban, uh, uh, Rabbeinu Bachye, 
the Vilna Gaon, the Arizal, uh, the, the, uh, the Shlak. Nobody understands until you came to the world. Nobody understands. Rabbi Vadya doesn't understand. It's kind of strange. They've toiled in Torah for the last few thousand years and then and you came and you understood something that's such a fundamental part of Judaism. But that's the thing, Rabotai. The Chazonish tells us that sometimes the bad shepherd doesn't mean bad. He means good. He wants you to like God. He wants you to connect to God. So what does he do? He humanizes him. That's what they did in Christianity. And that's what they did in many other religions. They humanize God. They make him something similar to you. Flawed like you. Weak like you. Minimized like you. They figure that if he's like you, you'll like him. Because people tend to like people like them. So they mean well. But that well leads to drowning that well leads to evil that well leads to idolatry that well leads to worshiping a foreign god it does not lead to serving god and when you speak to them and try to tell them listen what you're saying is wrong it's against the torah they look at you like you are a nazi german looking to put them into a gas chamber oh what are you talking about i know more than you you're not even qualified you know what you're talking about Said them, maybe you're right about all those things. Maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. Maybe I, uh, I'm not qualified. Maybe I'm ugly too. And maybe I'm all those things. But can you just at least give me a source so I can take it to people that are qualified, the people that are knowledgeable, the people that are smarter? Because I'm smart enough to know that I'm not the smartest guy. But that's why I have the smartest guys behind me. That's why I have a kolel full of dayanim. That's why I'm connected to many of the ado. They're really smart. So I give it to them. And I check everything with them. And guess what? They have no idea what you're talking about. So unless you are the hidden Mashiach of the generation that's going to bring new insights to the world, Torah that has never even seen Mount Sinai, perhaps you're wrong. Perhaps. Now this is the problem with the speakers. It's not going to be fixed until Mashiach comes. What about the problem with the listeners? You? The crowd that's listening? You see Rabotai, Sometimes the crowd, the listeners, are simply too respectful to the wrong people. They hear something that's contrary to what they learned and even the children's book for Jewish kids. Contrary to what they learned in school. Contrary to what they saw in the Gemara. Contrary to what they saw in the Chumash. They hear this stuff and it doesn't make sense, but this guy is such a famous speaker. He's so popular. They paid him so much money to come. Like, how could I question him? I mean, if he said it, he must be right. Wait, so if your wife said something about how she needs to buy, you know, something that's three times the budget, you assume she's right? Not really. You double check, right? If your husband says that he needs to go away for a few weeks to go on business, you just assume that he's right or you double check? You check, right? Well, if your kids say, listen, there's no school for the next month and a half, you assume they're right, you double, check, you double check, right? If the guy, if the customer says, listen, there's a sign over there that says everything that I take is free. You trust the customer or the customer is always right? Oh, you check, right? If the vendor says, by the way, the price is five times more than what it actually stays, just a mistake, everybody knows about it. You have to pay five, you, you trust them? No, you check, right? Everything else you check. Even if somebody shows you a piece of meat and says, you want to buy this for half price? It's kosher. What do you do if you have an ounce of Yirat Shemaim? You check. You double check. But for some reason or another, in today's world, if some speaker with or without a beard claims to be a rabbi, claims to be knowledgeable, tells you something completely foreign to Torah, completely foreign to any rabbi that has any understanding of a Torah, and he says, this is what it says. What do people do? Do they check? Do they double check? More times than not, they do nothing. Why? They're being nice. They're being cordial. They're being respectful. Now, if you were nice, cordial, and respectful, and you simply eliminated everything you heard, 
and let it go from one ear out the other and didn't take it into your life, perhaps that's something that a person can justify to a certain extent, especially if there's many people there and you're not in a position of any, uh, uh, any scholarship to rebuke the guy and debate him. But what do people do? They hear what the guy says. They don't even care if there's a source. They like it. He just told me that I'm allowed to sin and continue violating Shabbat because nobody goes to Gainon more than a year and quite frankly, everyone's going to Gainon. Why? Because everybody sins at least once. So if the maximum sentence is 12 months for everybody, so it doesn't make a difference if I keep anything or I don't keep anything, maximum sentence is 12 months anyway, so I might as well just continue being a sinner. And if he says that God needs me, then the next time before I do a mitzvah, I say, God, I'm going to do this, but on the condition of if you give me this, this, and this, I'm going to start giving God conditions. Why? Because he needs me. He needs me. And the next time we hear about Gainom, of course, I'm going to say, oh, this is uh, Christianity. This is not even Judaism. And, and start mocking the 13 principles of faith. They believe the nonsense without double checking, without triple checking. Yet, vaccine that's out there, people have more information about it than I think they have about their own children. The economy, people know more, know more about it than they know literally about the, their own family lineage. Politics, people know more about that than they know about their entire community or any part of their community. They know more about that than they know about even their own profession. Everything else, people double check. But when it comes to Torah, it's either people have an opinion that they feel like it's the same thing as Mount Sinai or they simply just believe somebody else's opinion, somebody else's made up words without double checking. The Chazuni says the power of the negative is greater than that of the power of the positive for the negative forces came first and the obligation to change came second. So all of those traits that are leading a person to not double check, all of those traits that are leading a person to not double check with their rabbi, not to ask the rabbi because they suddenly are concerned about his time, suddenly concerned about his honor, suddenly concerned about anyone else other than themselves, those traits are not going to lead you to any place good. Why? Because as a result of all of that, you're going to make many more sins and feed the sitra achra. Feed the evil side that will make that evil side more powerful, not only against you, to cause you to sin even further and get further from the truth, but it's going to cause others as well. And the reason why the Chazoni says that the negative forces came first is because the Prophet Job says, let the hollow man acquire heart. Let one who, who's like a wild ass be reborn as a man. This is a famous verse that everyone is familiar with, at least part of it. That the, uh, a person is born like a wild ass. Their uh, animal instinct of a person. Meaning that initially a person is born only with the evil inclination and only after some time does the good inclination develop. So while a person thinks that, oh yeah, but I'll use my good inclination that I have in order to do good. And even if I do some evil, it'll balance itself out. The Chazuni says no. The evil inclination came first. The damage that it causes is much more severe than the benefit of your good inclination, of the good things that you do. And a person needs to make sure to look at every one of their actions, double check everything, especially the things that are most sensitive. Business transactions, different arrangements, partnerships, decisions, all the things 
that are critical to your life, not just the simple stuff that's easy to discuss. Double check if you're going in the right direction because if you live your life without double checking this stuff, Hashem says, prepare yourself for the sword. And He didn't prepare the sword for you to see it. He prepared it just to scare you so you don't have to see it. Don't be foolish enough to test Him. Bezat Hashem, this too will give each and every single one of us the strength and wherewithal to overcome our weaknesses, overcome our own evil traits that are sometimes looked as good, overcome the confusion that's being dispersed out there in the public, even from rabbinical figures and rabbinical organizations. They all mean well, but none of them are going to help you when you go up to Shemaim. The only one that's going to be able to help you are the angels that you create as a result of the good that you do in accordance to the Torah, not in accordance to their imagination or yours. Bezat Hashem, we all create many, many good angels as a result of a lot of Torah and a lot of good deeds. Bechabat Tzachan, Bezat Hashem, we'll see each other again later this week. Let me know uh, what you think and make sure to share it because other people need to learn too.